Hello, I am Tatiana Mack, and I am an interactive art director and designer currently based in Portland, Oregon. I am really passionate about reflecting the diverse communities that we live in through my work, which means creating designs that are both inclusive as well as accessible. I've always really been intrigued by the role that art can play in reflecting our social landscape. And I realized I could be doing more as a designer to follow that ethic. So I started reading about web accessibility as well as the conditions that are affected by an inaccessible web. And I realized that a lot of style guides don't consider accessibility or outright break it. I'm really excited about talking about accessibility today, uh, but I do want to mention that I'm not an accessibility expert by any means, but I hope that my work in dozens of interactive style guides to create different experiences will help to provide you with a unique beginner's perspective so that you can learn to make your designs more accessible in a digestible way. Today's class will cover some fundamentals around web accessibility. You'll leave today's class with a baseline understanding of web accessibility guidelines, how to work within restrictive, incomplete, or inaccessible guidelines, and the common mistakes made, um, as well as how to fix them. Specifically, we'll discuss why you should care about accessibility, how to make a business case for accessibility in your company, the main categories of disabilities, as well as breaking down a style guide into its constituent parts of typography, color, and photography and imagery. Then, with that foundational knowledge, we'll look at the common mistakes made that make the web inaccessible. Then, we'll cover how to fix those mistakes so that you can start affecting your next style guide or website project. I've also included a checklist that you can run against uh, for your next project in the resources section. So I'm excited that you're here and let's get started. So you might be here because you've heard some buzz around hashtag ally or A11Y, which is a neuronym for accessibility or you just might want to do more in order to create accessible designs within your team. Regardless of the reason, I'm just excited that you're here and hope to equip you with some key ways to improve accessibility in your designs and encourage you with reasons why accessibility matters. Reason one, accessibility is for everyone, not just disabled folks. In fact, accessible design improves the experience for everyone. For those who don't require special needs, it just makes the experience easier to use. So it's of a universal benefit. Accessible design is often conflated with the term universal design, and they're not equivalent. Universal design expresses that a design should be as universal as possible and work for as many people as possible, recognizing that some designs won't work for everyone. Accessibility, on the other hand, starts with the specific special needs of different folks and designs from there first. Accessible design is often synonymous with inclusive design. And effectively, both terms mean that you're starting with the special needs and building from there so that you're including everyone. So the end goal is to make sure that all designs are accessible, and eventually, accessible design and universal design will be one and the same. But until we reach that level of saturation, it's important to consider the unique needs of people in order to maximize their experiences. There's this misconception that people who require accessible design are a small subset or a niche population. That's not true. Of the seven billion people in the world, roughly 15% of people require some sort of accessibility considerations because they suffer some sort of impairment. That equates to being about 1.14 billion users who are affected and who could be having a negative user experience because you're not considering accessible design. That's a huge number. Reason two, accessible design can provide huge economic gains at little to no additional cost. 
Accessible web standards intersect with a lot of other standards, such as SEO, or search engine optimization, legal considerations, technical considerations to make your site more performant, and responsive web best practices. So if you're making improvements to your SEO that are accessible, you'll gain the benefit of both at little to no extra costs. I think that's what we call a BOGO. Accessible design also increases the number of overall users, which can lead to increased engagement and increased conversion, which ultimately leads to more revenue. I think that's what business folks call a good return on investment. Reason three, unfortunately, because a lot of brands neglect accessibility standards, the brands that consider accessibility are set apart. So for example, if you have an e-commerce site with a smooth shopping experience for people who require accessibility considerations, they're gonna notice that you're a brand that seems to care enough to provide them with a positive experience. And ultimately, people care about brands that first care about them. Reason four, as modern designers, we need to understand the critical role that we can play in affecting positive social change. At our core, what designers are meant to do is to improve the lives and experiences of our users, all of our users. So we must acknowledge our privilege as designers and understand where our users are coming from. Part of being an ally is not niching a specific group of people, no matter how small the group. An aspect of our industry is using the term user or market share to describe a group of people who use a specific browser, device, or operating system. We use this term in order to prioritize and deprioritize different issues that occur because there can be so many. It's a necessary and pragmatic approach when talking about devices and browsers and clients because of all the permutations that can occur. But when we're talking about humans, this becomes highly problematic. While people can typically choose what device or browser they use, they can't choose to not be affected by their conditions. So we need to make sure we take care of them and provide them with good experiences. So the four reasons we just covered are four of the largest, but there are numerous other benefits to providing accessible designs. If you're looking for a specific one in order to make a business case for your stakeholders, I've included a list of resources in the description of the class. Before we dive into style guides, we'll want to lay a basic foundation of accessibility. We'll start with the categories of disabilities, the modes of disabilities, the types of assistive technologies, or AT, that folks rely on, as well as the web standards against which accessibility is measured. Laying this foundation will help to ensure that we're asking the right questions as early as possible within our projects. Let's start with the main six categories of disability. Visual, auditory, motor physical, neurological, cognitive, and speech. Users who are affected by visual impairment typically rely on screen readers or screen magnifiers or adjusting their browser settings. Auditory users are hearing impaired, so they usually rely on visualizations of audio content, such as closed captioning. Users who have motor or physical disabilities typically rely on assistive technologies, or ATs, that allow them to navigate the web with limited mobility, such as mouth sticks or eye tracking software or alternate keyboards. Neurological conditions can vary greatly based on the specific condition your user has, but a common one to consider in terms of accessibility is seizures. Folks who can experience seizures can be triggered by excess motion, so they'll often rely on reduced motion on their devices, which is a setting, in order to prevent these instances. 
Cognitive disorders, such as autism or Down syndrome, can vary greatly, like neurological disorders. So it's important to understand how these users are affected by the flow of content, for example. Lastly, it's important to note that this list of disabilities is not exhaustive and that users can be affected by more than one. These conditions aren't mutually exclusive. So users can have very compromised experiences. So as designers, we should ensure that we're maintaining that empathy and understanding and always seeking to learn better, more accessible ways to improve our designs. So the conditions I just described are all permanent, which means they'll affect the users for the rest of their lives. But as we mentioned before, making designs accessible helps everyone, not just disabled folks. So it can help people who are temporarily or situationally affected by that disability. For example, if we create a design that's navigable by one hand, that can help someone who is situationally in need of that assistance, such as someone who's holding a baby, or it can help someone temporarily, such as someone who has recently broken arm, and of course, someone who is permanently affected, so someone who only has one arm. Now, for people who have access to both arms, using that site will just be faster and easier, and they probably won't notice any difference at all. And I'm pretty sure that's what we call privilege. Here, I wanna mention that there are guidelines against which to measure our accessibility standards. The World Wide Web Consortium, or W3C, publishes the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG, and it is a, a really robust set of guidelines that could fill up an entire class. But for today, what you need to know is that they exist that they're the North Star for accessibility, and they are ultimately what we will be going over in our recommendations today. So now that we've established a baseline understanding of accessibility, the what and the why, let's talk about how we can implement accessibility into our designs by way of style guides. Something important to mention here is that I am a believer in design as a part of design systems. And what that means is I believe that design should be treated like a framework instead of a set of rules and regulations to abide by. And I believe in maintaining the spirit of the style guide as opposed to the letter law of the style guide. This dude does not abide, especially in the name of accessibility. When designing for web accessibility and digital design in general, it's impossible to maintain control of all the different combinations of devices and browsers. So we'll probably be breaking some rules in the following section, and that's okay. Style guides can range quite a bit in terms of how much they cover. Large corporate style guides can be 200 page tomes that are really great for getting to high shelves, whereas your local bodega might only have a five page style guide or maybe that's only here in Portland. Regardless, style guides cover the same types of sections. Today, we'll be going through typography, color, and photography and imagery. We'll discuss the common types of mistakes made within those three sections, as well as ways to fix them and make your designs more accessible. Type is typically the first section of a style guide. Well, after the 17 or 18 pages of appropriate logo usage. And its importance and priority makes a lot of sense. Type is the way that we receive our content and fonts are like the clothes of our content. But type can be complicated because its origins come from print. So many of the nuances that were created for print don't come across very well digitally and can cause accessibility issues. The main purpose of type is to provide you with the content, so it needs to be legible and clear. The W3C, WCAG, calls for type to be perceivable and understandable. That's the main measurement against which we will measure our examples today. Example one, your style guide calls for your paragraph type to be size 12 
which is too small. The first thing to do to fix that is to increase your paragraph text to 16, or better yet, 20. Then, from there, make your header tags proportionally increase based on the criteria outlined in the style guide. It's important to remember here that your users ultimately have control over how large the text renders on their device. So you don't want to hinge the success of your design based on having a specific font size because it'll break as they increase the font size. Example two, your style guide calls for font weights that are too thin, which can be hard to read, particularly for non-retina displays. My first recommendation would be to avoid using any thin type settings within the style guide. Now, that might not be possible, particularly with brands that have an affinity for using all thin weights across their entire font stack. Can't we just be a little bit more font weight positive here and include all font weights? Regardless, if you have to use thin fonts, make sure that you increase the font weight from 100, say, to 200 or even 300. The visual difference is somewhat negligible even to brand teams, and you'll increase legibility tenfold. Second, if you can't do that, then I would recommend relying on the fallback font. I found that a lot of style guides are written by print designers or environmental designers whose solution to digital type is just use Helvetica, which while not a very interesting choice, at least ensures that your content is legible. And that's ultimately what's most important. Example three, the style guide calls for centered text. Centered text is difficult to read because it changes the starting point of each line. This causes a huge cognitive load and is inaccessible. So a way to capture the spirit of centered text is to center the container and to left align the text within the container. That way, you'll maintain the spirit of centered text without causing accessibility issues. Centered text is not the only problematic type of text. And in fact, it's any text where the starting point changes. So for left to right languages, that includes right alignment. For right to left languages, like Arabic, that includes left alignment. Also, sorry to you newspaper fans, but justified text is also problematic because while it works well in print, it changes the amount of space between words, which causes a lot of issues in responsive design. For people who have cognitive disorders, it can cause something called blurring, which makes it very inaccessible and difficult for them to read. So a way that you can capture the spirit of justified text is to wrap your text in a container and add a background color or an outline so that you can capture the spirit of the justified text without causing accessibility issues. Example four, style guide calls for a lot of all caps text. All caps text is, first of all, difficult for people with cognitive disorders to read. Second of all, screen readers will read any text that's been typed out as all caps, so if you set your caps lock key on, as an abbreviation. So respect would be read as R-E-S-P-E-C-T. If you need to make text all caps for some reason, ensure that you're respecting sentence casing or title casing when you type it out, and then rely on the text transform uppercase property. But use it sparingly because remember, it's difficult to read. Example, header tags are used to only convey visual differences and not to convey content hierarchy. People with cognitive disorders rely on heading tags in order to help them understand the content architecture of your page. People with attention deficit disorder or memory challenges will rely on header tags to quickly skim the page or remind them where they are. So if you're just using it to convey visual differences, this can cause a really confusing user experience for these users. So by all means, avoid using header tags just to convey visual differences. 
make sure that your contents is in sequence and utilizes all of the heading tags in order. Additionally, HTML5 included some very helpful HTML attributes that help to clarify different types of sections. This is super helpful for screen readers because it provides additional context for what type of section the user is in. For example, article or section can help add additional hierarchy to the heading tags, so use them. Example, link stylings are only differentiated by color. Now, there are a small subset of colors that you can use to differentiate your link stylings from your body copy and from the background. But that window of colors is very narrow and it's likely that your style guide doesn't include those colors. So instead, I'd recommend you avoid that altogether and ensure you're adding an additional styling to differentiate links from body copy. The most common and widely understood is the underline. The underlining will ensure that your user knows that it's a call to action, which will help to differentiate it from the body copy. Secondly, you'll want to make sure that you don't use the underlining property for anything else because that can create a lot of confusion for your user. From a content perspective, you want to ensure that you're linking an appropriate part of the phrase. The reason for this is because users can utilize the screen reader to gather all links from the page to gain a quick overview of all of the links that you've included. What that does is it removes links from their context. So it's very important that isolated, those phrases can describe two things. One, what is it? And two, where are you taking me? Color is wonderful because it can help to differentiate or classify information and overall add a lot of personality to your design. But for somebody who suffers from color blindness, they won't be able to see that differentiation. So it's important that you use color in an additive manner in order to enhance your story. There's also color contrast consideration. So, the W3C WCAG includes levels of color contrast accessibility. You'll want to take these accessibility screens into consideration for your design. And a really helpful way to do this is to download the Stark plugin for Sketch. It's a highly simple but effective tool that will screen your designs for accessibility and tell you how you fail. Adobe Creative Cloud also includes in built-in accessibility filters as well. So make sure that you're reviewing your designs because it's way too easy not to. Example one, the style guide calls for light type on light background or dark type on dark background, basically any instance where there's not sufficient contrast. As I mentioned before, there are many tools to help you with contrast ratio. But a fun fact, because I know designers love gray type on white, is that hex code 767676 is the lightest form of gray that you can use against a white background and still gain a level AA grading at size 16 text. So if you'll remember from before, that's the very smallest you should be making your body copy. So you can still have those sexy grays. Just do it in an accessible way. Example two, the style guide calls for color combinations that vibrate. Color vibration, or chromostereopsis, occurs to colors that fall opposite of one another on the color wheel. And effectively, the two colors are just competing, which causes a visual vibration. Some examples include blue and red, red and green, blue and orange, you should avoid color vibration because it can cause cognitive overload and be dizzying, which is a really negative experience for all users. Imagery, like photography, illustration, and iconography can really help to enhance your story. They can provide emotion, personality, and help to articulate your brand beyond the content. There's an old journalism principle that applies to accessibility here, which is, is the image providing further context and additional story to what is already there? 
If it's not, you shouldn't include it. But if it is, let's make sure that we do so in an accessible way. Example one, style guides lack criteria around alt text for images. Alt text is the copy that is rendered when an image is still loading, has failed to load, and what a screen reader reads in lieu of the image. Alt text can help to provide the context that the image includes. So when we assess whether or not an image is helping to articulate our story, we need to make sure that our alt text describes how it helps to articulate the story. Despite being one of the most widely known aspects to web accessibility due to its intersectionality with SEO or search engine optimization, implementing alt text appropriately can actually be very difficult. There's tremendous literature around the appropriate nuances, and I really suggest that you read up on those because there are many and they're all very important. For today, we'll cover a few basics. First, you need to determine whether your image is providing content or a function. If it's providing content, then you should assess whether the image is besides a description that can help to describe it already. So, for example, on a museum website that has a painting um, encompassed with a long description that describes the painting, the artist, the year it was painted, then you don't need to include alt text in this instance because it would be redundant. But in most instances, this is not the case. Images require that content. So when that is the case, make sure that you are being as concise as possible because users are trying to quickly skim the content using their screen reader and long flowery descriptions will interrupt that experience. Second, if your image serves as a function, you should always include alt text. It would provide a confusing user experience if you omitted it. So always, 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 if it is linking somewhere, which is the most principal function that an image serves, make sure you include alt text. If you find that an image is highly complex, say a graph where there are a lot of aspects to describe, an alt text might not be appropriate because we want it to be concise. So in those instances, it may be more appropriate to use the HTML attribute of long desk or long description. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. So that covers some of the most basic aspects of alt text. Before we move on, I think it's important to mention that alt text is frequently something that falls on the hands of the last person who touches it which is typically a developer or an SEO specialist. And that is problematic because it's usually a rush to the finish. You're in QA and they notice that the alt text is missing. Instead, uh, this is a great opportunity to encourage your teams to start integrating alt text as part of your overarching information architecture because with accessibility, you can't be the only person on your team who's paying attention to this. So alt text is a great way to equip other members of your team into considering it earlier on, such as during the content hierarchy phase, because when done properly, microcopy like alt text can really enhance the story you're telling um, and provide a lot of additional context. Example two. Raster images are used when SVGs, or scalable vector graphics, could be used instead. SVGs are really awesome because they provide so much more than what raster images can. So for example, SVGs allow you to pinch and zoom for users who are vision impaired to gain more detail without requiring the bloating of large raster images. SVGs also allow you to customize certain CSS properties to help make your image more accessible. And there's tremendous amounts of animation and other additive properties that you can do that are really cool. So I'll cover a few basics for today. First, you'll wanna make sure that your SVG includes title and description attributes. Similarly to alt tags, this will help the user to understand the content of your SVG particularly for screen readers. Second of all, 
you'll want to ensure that for more complex SVGs, such as those that include a landscape or a graph, that you group like attributes and provide them with their own titles. So for example, a landscape image with a house and a car and a corgi should all have their individual titles. This will help for the user to gain an overview of these complex layouts. And like with photos, you'll wanna make sure to include alt text. Now, one exception for SVGs is that if they're decorative, that is they don't really, they aren't necessary to your content flow, you don't need to include an alt text. But you'll wanna make sure that you include what's called a blank alt text to ensure that the SVG renders properly. These are just a few basics. There is a lot of literature about SVGs, and I highly recommend that you take some time to read much of the literatures out there. And one of my favorite SVG experts, Sarah Suedan, has written dozens of articles and conducted lots of talks around SVGs and accessibility. Plus, she loves birds, so you can put an SVG bird on it. Example three, a brand guide relies heavily on data visualization in order to tell its story. Now, this in and of itself is not a bad thing. I don't know if you've noticed, but we're kind of in the age of data right now, and lots of companies, especially tech companies, rely on data visualization in order to provide a visual context for their highly complex information. Without it, they wouldn't have a lot to visualize. So it's wonderful that data visualization is having its coming of age right now. But we'll wanna make sure that we're including data visualizations in a very accessible way. Data visualization is excellent because it can take highly complex data and transform it into a digestible visual format. But we'll wanna remember that for those who don't have access to seeing it visually and ensure that we're providing them with helpful descriptions along the way. So there's two main ways that you can do that. The first is to describe a clear and concise description within your SVG or image. If your data is highly complex, like let's say there's lots of bar graphs or complex systems that are hard to describe concisely, I'd recommend using an HTML attribute called long desk. And what that effectively does is it links you to a separate page where then you can fully articulate the image and to provide all the contextual clues so that someone who's vision impaired can still gain all of the context of someone who can see the data visualization. Example four, a style guy relies heavily or exclusively on motion in order to help articulate or to enhance its story. I've seen some style guides that use motion in every instance possible. I'm sure you've seen sites that rely heavily on parallax and this is problematic because it can cause a lot of motion sickness for people who have vertigo, or it can cause cognitive issues for people who have disorders like autism. But motion, when used in moderation, can really provide a lot to your story and, and a little bit of whimsy. So there's two basic rules that you'll wanna consider around motion. First, does it enhance the story you're trying to tell? And second, can the story hold up on its own without it? If you answered yes to both of those questions, then by all means proceed. But the reason why it's important to make sure that the story is still coherent without it is that users have access to turning off motion in what's called reduced motion. Effectively, what that does is it removes interactions like parallax or bouncing, all of those interactions that we've become so familiar with today, in order to reduce some of that motion sickness that can occur. So you'll wanna make sure that your experience still stands true even without the motion. We just covered a lot of information there, um, but we really only focused on three main aspects of style guides, which are fonts, colors, and photography and imagery. There's a wealth of information out there uh, that we didn't cover today, and I'd highly recommend that you deep dive into it. I've included a couple of my favorite links in the resources section. But please read, evangelize, ask questions. The accessibility community is very welcoming and excited by anyone who um, is excited about accessibility. So onward. 
So you've assessed your design against these accessibility standards, and now you're ready for the next step, which is to send your design off to the powers that be. If you're agency side, that can mean sending it to your client's brand team, or if you're software or brand side, sending it to your C-level stakeholders. Regardless, you are probably a little bit nervous because you've technically broken some rules. There's two scenarios that can happen, and I'm gonna walk you through both. Scenario one, you send it off and it gets approved. Nice, you just stuck it to the man. Scenario two, you get caught. Luckily, I've spent a lot of my life watching legal procedurals, and that's gonna come in handy here because you're gonna treat this like a legal transaction. First, assess the rule of the style guide. Check that you actually broke the rule. If you did, then cite the W3C WCAG accessibility guidelines that have been broken by the style guide. Express how this negatively impacts your user. I find that it is really helpful here if you can find access to the specific data for the company because that allows you to turn the user into an actual tangible number. And if you can associate that number with engagement or better yet revenue, then you can associate a specific dollar amount. Sometimes you just gotta show them the money, lost. And if you still find that you're getting a lot of pushback, I find that it's helpful to try to strike a compromise and to get on the phone with the brand team, for example. It's important to note here that with accessibility, it's not about the quest for level AA perfection, though that would be great. So if the brand team is pushing back heavily on a specific shade of gray that you know not to be accessible, then Try to make it as accessible as possible while getting it through, because access is about ensuring the user gets the information. And if it never goes live, they won't get the information at all. This process can seem like a lot, especially if you're the only person on your team that seems to care about accessibility. But I promise that with each conversation that you have and a each rule that you describe to your team, it'll get a little bit easier each time. So keep carrying on. So a lot of what we've discussed today has been in the context of working within an existing style guide. But if the opportunity presents itself for you to create a style guide from scratch or a website from scratch, that's awesome. I highly recommend that you take the following approach. First, start with a clear skeletal wireframe. Your wireframe should have clear content hierarchy express your content in a coherent manner, and be highly accessible. Now, it'd be a little bit boring if every single website looked like a college thesis paper. Times New Roman, size 12, double-spaced. So atop this, we should feel free to use color and imagery and type in order to enhance our experience and give personality to our brands. We just need to make sure that as we add each of those additive properties, that the wireframe and its success of user experience gets maintained each and every step of the way. That way, everyone receives a clear user experience, and for those who have access to those improvements, they're still getting a great user experience as well. If and when those extras, love being extra, are stripped out by assistive technologies, your users are still left with a coherent user experience and your design won't be broken. And that's ACES. I highly encourage you to start with your next style guide in the wild. That can be for your own brand's internal style guide or your next client project. But regardless, I've included a checklist for you that covers all the material from today in the resources section. So please share your work and I'm excited to see your process and what you've learned. Uh, I can't wait to see. I want to mention that today, most of the accessibility considerations that we've made have been primarily for physical and mental disabilities, but there's a whole host of other considerations to be made in the name of social inclusivity. 
Social inclusivity can include everything from including non-binary gender options in your form fields to reflecting underrepresented races in your stock photography choices to creating a more performant site that functions on 2G internet speeds. It can be easy to be overwhelmed by the number of considerations to be made, but I like to remember that it's not about perfection. Instead, it's about taking small, incremental steps each and every day. So it can be as simple as improving a form on your website or starting a conversation about how to be more accessible with your team. Every step that we take moves us forward in this fight for a more accessible web. And with the technology ever evolving, we really need to keep this quest of perfection in mind. And in fact, the W3C, WCAG, will release its 2.1 release later this year. It's been about 10 years since the last one's been released, so there will be a lot of new information to learn and new ways to innovate within our space. Other ways that are innovating for fun, that are accessible, are CSS Grid, the work they're doing to create editorial and dynamic designs will allow us to have our cake and eat it too. The designs will be interesting, but they'll more importantly maintain their accessibility through their content hierarchy, and that's a really great thing. Being a good ally means being resilient as we continue this quest for making a more accessible and eventually universal web. As the role of technology expands in our users' lives, it's important that we make sure we bring all of our users along in a way that's both equitable and responsible. Thank you so much for watching my Skillshare class and congratulations on becoming an ally.